Welcome to From the Nest with Charity Jen. I'm your host, Jen Newmeyer. On this podcast, we have casual conversations with folks in the nonprofit field, exploring the success and lessons learned of topics like volunteering and fundraising strategy. I have a very special guest for today's show. It's rare that I get the opportunity to chat with a volunteer ambassador, not to mention a hunger relief advocate. We worked together on a 24-hour live streaming fundraising event several years ago. He was the host, and I was the project manager. We'll go behind the curtain to hear how it all started and why. You might be familiar with Freezer Burns, his frozen food review show from back in the day. Yes? (laughs) I said frozen food review show. Joining us today is Greg Ng. He is currently the CEO of Brooks Bell and owner of Follow Greg Sports Photography. And if that is not an array of talents, wait to hear how he's also affiliated with the Smithsonian right here in Washington, D.C. Per usual, there was so much to cover in limited time, but nonetheless, you'll find plenty of valuable takeaways. Listen carefully to hear his take on keeping passionate supporters engaged. So important going into these summer months. Buckle up for an intense ride. This is From the Nest with Charity Jen. The equation is simple. Successful elections equal most people voting minus two-party partisan bullying. The Independent Voter Project takes this belief to the airwaves on the Independent Voter Podcast. Follow and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, everyone. This is Kayla with March and Ash. I wanted to let you know about a great chance for $7,100 store credit as part of our 710 celebration. So from June 10th to July 10th, go to marchandash.com slash 710 to sign up for your chance to get $710 store credit valid at any March and Ash location. For more details, go to marchandash.com. Enjoy responsibly. Hi, Greg. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. It is great to see you. Thanks, Jen. It's great to see you too. I mean, it has been it has been a few years now, hasn't it? We haven't it, it we has. haven't spoken a long time. I've been following along though and and uh, seeing the the great work that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I have been following along uh, on your amazing journey also. So, uh, you are now the CEO of Brooks Bell, is that right? That's right. Yeah. And you're and you're moving into a new location. You're based in Raleigh, based in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah, we um we were in a an office space in um the Glenwood South area of Raleigh, North Carolina, and now we've uh, moved to a more uh downtown location. So we're very excited about about that momentum. Yes. And um Brooks Bell um remind me is uh marketing optimization Yes. That kind of thing. So yeah, tell, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Marketing experimentation. Um, we are a um, consulting firm that works with brands specifically around um, customer insight and how organizations can can better read the signals that their customers are giving them and and uh, be more responsive to them uh, in the marketplace. Yes, and we could sure use that in the nonprofit uh, arena as well. (laughs) We were, uh, I actually am working, so um, as you know, I'm at at PBS now, working with stations all across the country, and we were just talking about like user journeys and the importance of uh, testing and experimentation and all of those fun things that I think you probably were the first one to talk to me about way back in, I don't know, 2010. (laughs) <laughs> I think so. I think over, over 10 years ago, which which makes me feel incredibly old. I know. I know. Doesn't it? It's like, wait a second. That was just yesterday that we were going to lunch and talking about how to improve email opens. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> So, um, so I am, I'm really thrilled to have you on the show because, uh, I, I love the, um, sort of history, uh, that we have had together and your history of volunteering, uh, specifically with my former organization, the Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina. And, uh, and, and in fact, I, I think that our story was so compelling. I included it in my book. 
Chap- sure chapter nine. <laughs> Sure did. Yes. <laughs> talking talking about the importance of ambassadors. But um, so I would love to hear like your perspective of getting involved with the food bank back then. And I was trying to remember if it was that I had the social media ambassadors group established and that's how you joined or did you come to the food bank interested in volunteering and then join the social media ambassador? It was actually the latter. Okay. Um, I did come to the food bank um, specifically to see how I could get involved. Mm-hmm. Um, and through that reach out, um, I, I remember it like it was yesterday, although now we're, we've established it was over 10 years ago. Right. I remember jumping on a conference call with you and some of your colleagues and us talking through all the possible ways that I could help. And, and one of the um, things that, that was brought up during that meeting was uh, about being a social media ambassador, which was a, a very uh, no brainer for me. Yes. And it, I do remember that phone call as well, because um, at the time when I was uh, at the food bank, uh, we would get a lot of calls of people who would want to help, want to do food drives, want to get involved. And um, and I remember that we were on the call and you were talking about a big idea that you had that you wanted to bring to the food bank. And we kind of we kind of like took a deep breath because there are lots of people that come to the food bank and say, we have a big idea. And, you know, resources from a staffing standpoint are very, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, we, we're not swimming in resources. And so, sure. so we have to be very, um, you know, we have to kind of choose what kinds of projects are going to have the um, best impact. But you had suggested something very interesting to us. It took us all by surprise. And I think that when we got off the phone call, we all started to scream with excitement. (laughs) (laughs) And so, uh, so tell us a little bit about that idea that you had that you brought to the bank. Um, I think it might help for me to start with saying that I really believe when it comes to volunteering, um, when it comes to participating um, in one of the many different nonprofits or causes that um, that one would feel personally attached to, um, that it's really important to remind ourselves that there are many things that we individually take for granted um, as being easy or being less hard, um, and uh, that that a lot of great organizations could use help with. Um, and so for me, I was uh, deeply involved at the time. I was the CMO of Brooks Bell. Now I'm the CEO. Um, so certainly understood a lot about marketing, about engaging with people, about um, influencing uh, people, about educating uh, messages. And, and I also had maybe a unique uh, opportunity and skill set of understanding how to do that via video. And so the idea that I brought to all of you at the food bank was let's do a 24 hour internet streaming telethon, (laughs) much like what we all grew up doing, uh, watching on TV. Um, And instead of manning phones, let's man um, an internet based uh, or online donation form. And let's pack it full of content to, to really help educate um, those in our community of the great work the Food Bank does. And I think that that sort of grand idea um, was, uh, it seemed so intimidating uh, for us. And I remember uh, Peter Warbicki, who was the CEO of the Food Bank at the time said, Jen, do you, do you really think that this is something that, that we like, it seems like a very, very big project, but to your point of bringing your talents, your skills, your background, you actually brought an audience. You had done this kind of thing before Mm -hmm. for other causes, and you had a really big following on YouTube that I think was, um, you know, something, of course, the, the reach that, uh, that you had with your own networks was something that 
in addition to your skills and experience doing this sort of, you know, live streaming event um, was another element that was a part of it that made it really impactful. Right. It, it, it was, I, I think that, so first of all, very pleased to announce that we were very successful in that first yeah. year, even though we were a little nervous about it <laughs> um, and successful in subsequent years. I, I hosted three years in a row. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things that, that really um, helped was that it was newsworthy. There are many different things that nonprofits can do and do and do continue to roll out as programs or special events or fun, major fundraisers. And this was something that no one had ever heard of before. It instantly got a lot of press. It instantly was set up so that we could highlight all the different facets of the food bank, which is vast and very diverse. And we had 24 hours of content um, to, to fill. Um, and it was just a little, uh, scary. It was just a, just a little feel felt a little out of reach that, um, it caused a lot of people to tune in. And so just simply the fact that I, as a host would be on camera on mic for 24 straight hours is, is a big feat to begin with. Now I can leverage that kind of shock value to, to really drive sponsorship as well as viewership. Right. And I think uh, one of the things that I loved about the entire concept was that it involved so many different departments, so many different partners, so much engagement to so many different audiences in different ways because of the fact that it was 24 hours of content that we had to fill. But we really did some very creative um, fundraising types of um, elements to it. For instance, having corporate partners that would um, support uh, the campaign with a large gift, be featured, they would bring all of their folks down to the warehouse where we were airing uh, the show, um, bring all of their folks down, um, do a check presentation, have the time to be interviewed with you and talk about, you know, their, um, you know, uh, thoughts on giving back to the community. And, um, and, and I, and so, you know, there were the corporate partners, then there were volunteers who would come in and, you know, there were, there were kids that would come in and make their donations. Like I would love to hear, uh, and, and just, you know, for, you know, for our audience, I mean, we had a dunk tank, we had mascots, we had a clown one year, we had, a, we had, we had a magician, a magician. <laughs> we had a live event, we had midnight volunteering, we had a barbecue, we had music, we had veggie yoga, we dressed right. up in, as, right. <laughs> <laughs> like, even in the middle of the night, trying to think of unique, uh, things that we could do. We, we had one of the, our former, co former colleagues, Molly, who was from Wisconsin, do a cheese, blindfolded cheese tasting. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, so for me, I think what I loved was it just hit all of the, um, from, from acquisition to, you know, engagement to cultivation, to stewardship, with all of these different audiences. Um, and I, it just is such a good example of the kind of campaign where you really are very thoughtful about everyone that you have involved. I think that it was not only successful in the money raised in a short amount of time, but it was also extremely successful in outreaching to organizations and individual people who eventually become individual donors, sustaining do, uh, donors, um, about the core messages that the food bank and, and substitute food bank messaging for, for any nonprofit um, has. Every nonprofit has a number of key points that they want the audience to be aware of. Mm -hmm. We had 24 hours worth of time to do so. Right. And so 
not only was I able to very clearly articulate for the the biggest part of the broadcast, which was at the very beginning and at the very end, um, where the biggest biggest viewership, um, the simple things of how many meals does one dollar feed, what percentage of every dollar that's donated goes straight back into the community, what are the different locations, how does one volunteer, um, how what is the process of of um, a farm to uh, to uh, to the food bank warehouse and and highlighting all the great uh, people within the organization. It was also a, a huge value because now you can actually personify the great work that um, that the uh, the team at the food bank was doing. Um, it was just a, a huge opportunity for branding. It was a huge opportunity for outreach and marketing, and those types of things are are you know, last all through the year. So mm-hmm. it, it, I, I want to reiterate that it, it really does take something that requires not just one creative idea, but many, 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 many creative ideas to fill within that. We had countless planning meetings that first year, but I remember Jen, and maybe this is revisionist history, but in the year two and three that I hosted, we had dramatically less because we were we had already built the template for a run of show for 24 hours, by the way. I'll never forget that spreadsheet. <laughs> um, but we now had returning guests and we now had returning things that worked and things that didn't. And so we could try try new things every year. So mm-hmm. it was just a, a phenomenal opportunity. I, I um, hold it in such high regard as, as one of the things that, that I'm, I'm most proud of. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I absolutely agree. I, and I think that that is such a, um, a key message for nonprofits, especially, believe it or not, um, still many nonprofits are still struggling to understand digital fundraising and digital engagement within their organization. Who owns it? How do we collaborate? What are, you know, there are so many layers and so many, you know, Sometimes there are silos and and other and you know issues from a tech you know a technology standpoint or a tech stack, um, but I think you have hit on something that um, is very important and and something that I also try to communicate is you can't just do it the first year, say that it was a sex, s- success or a failure, and not like it takes time to build on it, yeah. and I think yes, like in those final years. We did have a template. We had returning partners. We had people who were excited to come back. And because we had the content already, you know, we had hours and hours. I think they're even still on YouTube. Some of them. I they are, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hours and hours of uh, basically content that could be used to, to show future partners exactly what the um, show looked like, what the campaign looked like, the impact that they were making in the community and how they could um, easily get involved. That's right. So, yeah. So let's go back to um, just sort of talking about that first year, because you're right. We did have a lot of meetings because, you know, it was not just, it was not just who was going to be responsible for what? I mean, we had to decide who was going to monitor the chat for 24 hours. Right. And luckily, we, we had Mike, who, uh, you know, good friend of yours, who came in to sort of help and stood yep. by your side the whole <laughs> Mike Adams was there the whole time. Who I still uh, work with. Yes. Oh. Today. Yes. Oh, yes. We'll tell him I said hello. Yeah. <laughs> but um, also some of the other elements, because we were I mean, we were we had lots of big ideas. We had you know, we had uh, back back in the day when there were tweet ups and festivals and social media. We had a social media mixer. We had midnight volunteering. So we had the show. But then we were also trying to attract people down to the, you know, to the location so they could be on site. I think the first year in my mind, I had imagined that we were going to have like a studio audience. (laughs) Right. right. I don't think that didn't work out so well, but (laughs) (laughs) there there were lots of lessons that we had from that first year, even from the technology. Um, We now remind me because we were going to use Google for uh, what, what were the, what were we going yeah. to do with that? Yeah. Originally, we uh, that was our biggest concern. We were in a warehouse. 
um, a warehouse that does not require a lot of bandwidth um, from a digi- from a digital streaming standpoint. And here we were saying, okay, we're in this warehouse and we now need to stream video for 24 hours straight. Yeah. Yes. So not only were we worried about the reliability of that connection, but we were worried initially about would we have enough bandwidth? And I remember we did a lot of tests there and um, I, I don't remember the partner that that came through, but that we did have a partner come through to ensure we had a, a constant connection. And that was very key from a tactical standpoint. I will go back to Mike. Um, Mike was served as kind of the producer who also helped make sure that my mic was always live and, you know, the lights were fine and, and, um, and reminder to, to take breaks <laughs> at times because, you know, speaking for an hour is, is hard enough. Speaking for 24 hours is, is quite a feat. Um, and he and I had done a 24 hour telethon online um, just one year prior for, for another nonprofit we learned so much in that time. Yeah. Um, so uh, the food bank benefited from actually um, us making all the big mistakes <laughs> the year before. <laughs> and so we knew that we had a great opportunity to hit the ground running. Um, but yes, there was just so many little moving parts um, that went into it. And it was such a great team effort. And here's the great thing about it. That core team in year one expanded and became that core team in year two and year three. And I still keep up with all of these people because, um, because we spent a lot of time together, yes. <laughs> you know, not only planning, but actually executing the, um, the, uh, the telethon. And, um, and we made, we, we raised a tremendous amount of money in, yes. in just a short period of time. That's right. Yeah. I think in the first year it was about 25,000, but in subsequent years, every year was a $50,000 right. event. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not, so, not too shabby for 24 hours. That's right. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right. So let's talk a little bit about that support that we had. So we had a really very engaged group of people called the social media ambassadors for uh, the food bank. They were, and, you know, I'll just um, sort of plug how that got started. You know, I, at the time was, um, launching all of the food bank, uh, social media platforms, website redesign, you know, new, you know, email strategies, email campaigns, those kinds of things. And I had a lot to learn. So I started going out to all of these, you know, the triangle, um, AMA, the American marketing association, which I believe you were, um, Mm -hmm. very much involved with for a long time, maybe even still involved with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, they had uh, meetings, like I said before, this was the, these were the years of tweet ups and festivals and social media, you know, groups and meetups. And um, so I was attending all of these things locally. At the time, Raleigh, the Raleigh area was a very vibrant networking kind of community. And as I was talking to people about what I was do, you know, what I what I did for a living at the food bank, a lot of them were saying, oh, I would love to get involved, but like, I just don't have time to come down to the warehouse, you know, volunteering hours are limited during the week, that kind of thing. And so I said, well, you can really help by using your social media platforms to help spread the word about the food bank. And that was sort of how the social media ambassadors got started. And they were such a huge part of this event. And like you had said before, we would have meetings, uh, monthly meetings and, uh, you know, assignments and people were reaching out to partners locally to, you know, for sponsorship and helping out with the event. And, um, I would, I would love to hear like from your perspective, looking back, um, sort of, you know, what you thought of that group and, and how, and how their, you know, their kind of impact on the, on the, uh, on the event. Yeah, certainly the, um, I was a social media ambassador for about 10 years, actually. Wow. Um, and in those beginning years, for sure, um, there were, there was a lot of engagement, uh, in terms of, um, within our group, but also, um, supported and planned by your team. So, um, even just sim- 
simply the idea of having a um, kickoff of the year with the social media ambassadors at the warehouse is such an important part. We're taking pictures, we're um, pushing out content and doing things like that. It's really the humanizing of the actual words. So um, there is a superficial level of, of that type of engagement where it's, yes, I agree to sh- retweet or share um, any type of content and tell people in passing, uh, yes, I'm, I'm involved or I know a little bit ab- about, um, about some of the great work that the food bank does. Um, but it's the community that is overlaid onto that, that then says, oh, wait a minute, are you volunteering next Wednesday? Because maybe I'll join you. Oh, maybe, hey, network, who wants to join us, right? Um, how do we then, when we're at AMA meetings and we see an, a, a fellow ambassador talk about the food bank to the other people within our table? And so um, I think it's really important to, to understand that it, it's important to put structure into a program and to feed it um, with things like here are some um, exclusive type information or opportunities. Here are some um, uh, opportunities to engage with with others. But really the real magic there is that you're through affiliation creating community. And so that was the part where now all of a sudden other ambassadors, I now know because they volunteered just as I had, they believe in the same things that I do about food insecurity in our area. And so now that's just another piece for me to engage personally with that person. And now we start to form bigger bonds, all um, kind of empowered and provided by by the structure of that program. So it, it was a great opportunity. Um, and, and I learned a lot. And by extension, my network learned a lot. And now all of a sudden things can kind of fracture off. I mean, after the telethon, um, I, I'm not sure if you remember this, but I, I did a peanut butter program. Um, because I learned through all the work with the telethon, how in demand peanut butter was, um, for food banks. And so I made it a point to just focus on raising awareness about peanut butter. Yes. (laughs) Right. And so for me, those are different ways that, that we could, um, we can help out even as late as in the beginning of the pandemic, I started doing work, um, for something called the front steps project. Um, where I would take photos of families during quarantine. Um, And what did I choose for where they can make donations? The food bank. So this is is not um, something that is by accident. It came out of real deep involvement and understanding of what a great organization our local food bank is. And by the way, there are thousands, tens of thousands of great organizations around the country who are doing similar things and important things. Um, It really is about understanding why they do it, what they're doing, how you can help and to help in ways that you have um, your own skill set to do. And so it started with me asking the question and and it uh, resulted in um, in a great experience. Yeah. I, yeah, it really, I, I love the um, sort of um, uh, image of, you know, you as as a person getting involved and you know the ripples that you know that just sort of happened within the community um it it was it was very it was a very special group still is a very special group and um and uh really really making a tremendous difference for folks in the, um, in central and Eastern North Carolina, for sure. Yeah. So tell me when you are thinking back, uh, to the telethon, I would love to know what were maybe some of your favorite, um, interviews elements, you know, were there, were there a couple of moments that just really stood out to you and stayed with you all these years? Uh, yes, some some more trying than others. <laughs> uh, let me let me start with the most traumatic. Um, let's see if I still have it. I uh, I do not. Um, the most traumatic is that um, one of the years I decided that I was going to sort sweet potatoes all by myself. Yes, <laughs> I remember in, that. <gasps> an entire bin. Yes, um, and that is a lot of work. That's typically, you know, the work of eight people over an hour 
Um, I did it um, myself for, I think, three hours straight. Yeah. Um, that, that um, I had a lot of appreciation for, um, for the great work that the volunteers do um, in that. So that was a little trying. <laughs> yeah. It was three in the morning. Um, and that was tiring. But I got to interview so many amazing um, partners of the food bank and to understand that there are different ways in which other organizations partner with the food bank to do the great work they're doing all with the same cause. How do we um, create food stability? How do we ensure that um, children uh, are, um, uh, you know, taken care of, our elderly are taken care of, um, that they're able to focus on school and they're able to um, do all that great work and the highlights of of interviewing um, the local team. And so, yes, I, I got to interview so many people over those three years, probably over 100 people. <laughs> um, and just to see how each person individually was doing their part. And that was kind of the common trend I was trying to uh, ask of the viewer is to say, here is another example of one person who has this set of skills, who is applying it to do these types of things. And so um, I think that that's kind of the theme that that I, I still take with me. Um, just uh, just amazing work from each person. Not all the same. Um, one one woman was a, a glass blower who decided that she was going to just make these special things, these pumpkins, and donate donate the the money. Right. Um, uh, and even the the local companies that we got to meet who became sponsors, hearing about uh, the work that they do, the schools that um, do it. I will never forget Sanderson High School, who, you know, would always win, win out on donating the most uh, out of all the schools. And, um, and it, th to me, those, those all kind of blend together and give me that just warm feeling of what a diverse community we have, who are each and every one of them contributing in their own special way. Right, right. And going going back to that traumatic experience, <laughs> yes. um, let's just describe uh, for the audience, like the bins are giant, like when you're standing next to them, they come up to above your above your waist to your. Yeah, almost yeah. almost to my shoulders. Yes. Um, so they're they're not only large in width and height, uh, width and depth, uh, but to actually get to the bottom of it, you have to really reach in, almost lift a, a foot up to get the leverage to reach in. Yeah. Um, and the process of that was, um, these are sweet potatoes of which uh, many, many, many sweet potatoes here in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the idea is to group them in these mesh bags and then tie a knot on them. And that way you can actually separate them to um, to family settings. And there, there is a standard of it. It's like two really large ones or, you know, uh, three medium sized ones or two large ones and two small ones, but you're picking through. Um, I, I couldn't even imagine. Um, I, I mean, it, it may have been five to 7,000 sweet potatoes in that bin. Um, and to individually wrap those, uh, was, uh, was a lot. Yes. <laughs> <was a> lot. <laughs> <laughs> at three in the morning. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I think that that was like one of the uh, the craziest ideas that we had were always sort of in the middle of the night because it's sort of like, how can we pe get people to tune in at two or 3 a.m.? Uh, right. You know, and so that was one crazy idea. I think there was another one where we had uh, the barbecue, um, the uh, kakalaki. Barbecue, yep. they came down and, and were serving, we were, we, I don't know why we thought that people at 2 a.m. and would want barbecue sandwiches. We, we, yeah, barbecue sandwiches. <laughs> but they, they came down to the warehouse with their big, uh, you know, uh, barbecue. Uh, yeah. Yeah, smoke, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. And the sandwiches were delicious. I, I mean, I loved they them were. at 2, 2 a.m. <laughs> they were. We had a food truck rodeo. Uh, yes. At one point, um, 
We had our um, local um, roller derby team, the Carolina Roller Girls. That's right. I remember um, that. Yes. We had Wooly Bull from the Durham Bulls uh, show up. We had a magician. Uh, what I was looking for earlier is that uh, we had a magician who bent a fork and right in front of my eyes. And I just, I couldn't believe it. And I, I, I have it still somewhere around here. <laughs> I still have this fork, um, which was amazing. Um, so yeah, it was just such a diverse group of, um, of guests. Um, some of which I still, uh, keep tabs on and, and, um, have become lifelong friends. And yeah, uh, yeah a lot of those, a lot of that content is still, um, on YouTube. Yeah. And like you were saying earlier, going back to each of those partners with their unique skills, their unique background, you know, um, even the unique, you know, like we had food donation, you know, we had food donations, we had cookies brought in, you know, at midnight for the volunteers that were there, um, you know, from the local local cookie shop. I mean, everyone sort of contributed in their very unique ways. They all had something special to bring. Right. And right. it just created sort of this, it, and the event itself almost was a community. I agree. The event was a community. And when we talk about dollars and cents, when we talk about the real economics of why this worked, um, it was a win-win for brands and organizations and companies around the area. We were getting press. Um, local news was picking up, picking it up. It was streaming on the internet people were tweeting it we were uh, the hashtag was getting a, a lot of love um and because of it some brands and local companies that we didn't even reach out to were becoming very opportunistic we we had pizzas show up um <laughs> because they saw us on the on the stream and they said let me send pizzas and sure enough um i had no problem um on air saying thank you for those pizzas right, right. Because if I can engage them as a small business and they can get something out of it, some exposure, that's a win for everyone. Now, yeah. all of a sudden, their employees see it and they may get other business, but um, it, all the while, more people are hearing the message that we're inter interweaving in of what is our, what do we need? Why do we need it? What is, what is the great work that we can do? And um, the other part of it is, you know, when we had the goal of 50,000, I remember um, we started to really break it down. We used to say, look, we want 5,000 by this time. And that was very, very helpful. We had a lot of repeat donors. We had a lot of opportunities in the moment to say, we're only at $200 away. Who's going to be the one to put us over, over the top? And then I would call them out on the stream. And then in, in some cases, they would then come to the warehouse later and I could thank them in person. So um, just it was just a great, great, um, great opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is one thing I want to touch on when, uh, uh, that I think is important because I, I don't want to, um, sort of, I, I want to underline the, you, you know, what were you, what you were saying earlier about talking and interviewing people for 24 hours straight, you actually wouldn't talk for how many days before the telephone? Yeah, two or three days before. Two or three days, and you drank a lot of tea to kind of save your vocal cords. Um, was there a year where you did start to lose? You lost your voice toward the end. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, it was the second year I started to lose my voice. Um, we got through it. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, I will also say the, you know, the very first time we did it at the food bank, we also made the mistake of starting it at midnight. We went oh, midnight right. to midnight. And yeah. in future years, we went noon to noon, which was yeah. actually better. <laughs> right. Um, so that was another example of um, going noon to noon was a, it changes your sleeping schedule. It, but it also what we loved about that was in the beginning part of the telethon where it's most important to gain momentum, people are awake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> companies, local companies are not only awake, they're working. And so now they can come and we did the the second year, I remember we did, or maybe it was the third, we did a, a food truck rodeo right at the beginning. So now all of a sudden we could get local companies to come out during the workday 
see the warehouse, participate, and get lunch while, while they're there. So that's another example of how just evolving it. But it was very taxing on my body. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I could do it now. Um, but 10 years ago, I was willing and able. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I agree. I 100% agree. Because for us, you know, as staff, like there was no sleeping, you yeah. know, there was not, I think one year we did bring in cots because we had intended to rotate and sleep, but there was, you were, there was just so much excitement and it was impossible to try to relax enough, right. you know, plus you, you're in a warehouse, like on a cot, like just yeah. not, not the best kind of sleeping. Right, right. Not easy experience. to sleep. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. So the other, uh, uh, question uh, that I just sort of wanted to kind of touch on is just, you know, when you are, when you are thinking about this experience and you're talking to uh, other people about getting involved with nonprofits, you know, what are, what are some of the tips or advice, you know, when you, when you heard about the food bank in UK or any of the organizations that you were very passionate about, because you were very much involved in a lot of different organizations at the time. I think at the state fair, you did a live remote for Movember. Uh, that, uh, Movember was, was the first telethon that we did. Okay. Um, but yes, the state fair, we did a state fair um, uh, tweet up, live tweet up, um, which uh, was really um, to benefit the, um, the NC uh, farm uh, and, and food um organization and to highlight the state fair. Um, but yes, I was involved in, in many different organizations. I still am. Um, I think for me, the, 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 the issue of food is something that I felt really strongly about, um, and continue to, um, mainly because it's very easy to forget, um, when you live in an area that is somewhat affluent or, um, very, um, where, where you're not worrying about where your next meal is coming from. Um, and it's very important to, uh, and easy to say, well, you know, I believe in feeding America, which is a great organization and, and um, that has a national footprint. For me, it was really about how can we make change locally? How could I um, really try to pay it forward um, to my neighbors, to my local community, to my, my kids' classmates, to, um, to organizations uh, nearby. And so that's where I've really zeroed in over the years. Um, and there are so many different ways to fundraise and to get, and to get the, you know, the ideas out. Um, I just think it's really important to continue to evolve and take chances and, and, um, and really um, push uh, towards um, people who bring a lot of energy from a third party perspective to your cause, to your goals, to those things, because um, I think it would be, would have been safe to say that um, maybe even just my network on Facebook, who are personal friends of mine, who are neighbors, colleagues, past classmates, um, who may have followed the food bank on Facebook and seen some messages when it comes from their friend who then says, yeah, this is the message that you've already seen, but this is specifically what it means to me. Now, all of a sudden that holds a lot of weight, right? Yeah. Um, and I just think that, that that type of personal engagement, personal affiliation and endorsement is just so valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you empower your ambassadors uh, to, uh, to do that, to take it to the next level? Yeah, yeah. With your sort of marketing uh, background, which I know is just, um, you know, so extensive and so uh, there's so much depth to it. If you were to give some advice to nonprofits, again, this is a nonprofit podcast, mm -hmm. of um, some things that they should think about when um, putting messages out there or, or, you know, attracting volunteers like you that do have so much passion, do you think there's something in particular, I know you had mentioned sort of the, you know, humanizing of uh, those messages and sort of like behind the curtain, do you have, what, what kind of advice would you, would you give to nonprofits who, you know, are, are looking to create that kind of 
um, experience and support from a volunteer standpoint for their organizations? Yeah, it's um, that's a great question. And it's the same advice, actually, that we give our clients um, who have a thousand, a mil- 500,000 X more budget, right? And that is this, um, especially with digital fundraising, there are there exists the tools and platforms and technology where you can automate a lot of these things. You can automate your emails. You can automate your thank you uh, communication. You can automate um, how um, donations or individual fundraising can be can be started by by um, local people around your area. What's missing in um, for profit business is the same thing that's missing in nonprofit business. And that is that personal engagement. So what I, the advice I would give is, let's say you have a, a, a list of 50,000 people, 50,000 households that you send an email newsletter out to. Identifying who that top 100 person, people are out of that 50,000 or 1,000 people if you have that much scale ability to do so and reaching out to them personally you can still send that newsletter but send that newsletter and say hi jen thank you so much um for volunteering last week yeah i missed you but i heard that you did x um just that personal affiliation is enough to then reinvigorate someone that maybe is a casual supporter in and energize them into saying I do feel a little bit of appreciation here. And now I, what else can I do? You know, and um, ideally you want to get to the point where you can do all of those things for every single person. Um, but technology again gets in the way and so does budgets and so does scale and your ability, your, your team size. And so it's very, very easy to say, wait a minute. Oh, I can just set, push a button and send it to all these people. Now, when you're looking at conversion rates, and you're wondering why those conversion rates are flat, the, it's really easy to say, well, if it's going to be flat, I need to add X percent more people to my list. And that's partially true. Mm-hmm. But I would ask people to consider, um, how do you identify um, the donors or, or members of your list that have the higher propensity to be engaged in a deeper way? And how do you reach out directly to those people? Yeah. That goes such a long way. Yes. Yeah. And I think that the example that we have here with the community that was created um, with the social media ambassadors through an event like the telethon that just, you know, built on that momentum year after year is sort of a perfect example of one of many examples, of of course, uh, but um, a good way to go about that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to be mindful of time, Greg, but um, before we go, I just have a few more questions for you. Mm -hmm. I would love to uh, do a lightning round uh, with you of uh, some questions just to kind of get to know, you know, uh, you a little bit more and the kinds of things uh, that you're interested um, in. Mm -hmm. So are you ready? I am. Okay, great. Tea or coffee? Ooh. Uh, always coffee for my first cup and then tea the rest of the day. Okay. All right. Sunrise or sunset? Sunset. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Fireplace or fire pit? Fire pit. Fire pit. Okay. Yes. Like the outdoors. Uh, plane or car? Ooh. Uh, plane because I love travel. Yes. But car, because I love driving. I will say plane. Okay. Okay. And then final, uh, and I think that this is kind of right up in your alley and you may have a lot of thoughts about it. Coach or play? Oh, that's a great question. (laughs) (laughs) I could speak another hour on this. (laughs) Because I know you're very involved with your kids. They play soccer. Uh, They're very, and you love, and you're a photographer as well. And you take wonderful photos of them. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely coach. Um, I, even in my job as a leader, um, I gained such great satisfaction in mentoring and coaching and, um, and finding success by seeing through success of others. Yeah. 
And I think that even when I was at the food bank, you were such a good coach for me, uh, just starting to, you know, sort of dip my toe in the water of uh, digital uh, engagement and fundraising. And you gave me um, such great advice. So I just thank you, Greg, for joining us on the podcast, sharing your knowledge, but also just, you know, sort of the history uh, that we had in the good old days of the telethon. <laughs> it's so great to see you. Please keep in touch. Okay. I will awesome. do. All right. Thanks. Thanks great. See you. Right. What an inspiring conversation. Greg is truly incredible. And as if that wasn't enough, after our recording, Greg discovered that a photo from the telethon is currently featured at the Smithsonian Museum of American History as part of the Giving in America exhibit in D.C. And while we didn't get a chance to talk about it, you can read more and see photos with links to the show at charitygen.com slash Smithsonian. Plus, you'll see further evidence of his passion and dedication to the community and how it shines through all of his work. I love how he describes the impact of each person bringing their talents and skills to contribute to the collective and how harnessing that energy around a fundraising campaign can make such a difference. It was truly an exciting conversation for me. If you'd like to hear more great conversations, visit charitygen.com to replay this and previous episodes. While you're there, you can sign up for my monthly newsletter, access free guides, and learn more about my book, The Insider's Guide to Online Fundraising. This has been From the Nest, where fundraising takes flight. Thanks for listening. This episode was produced by Olas Media Network in San Diego, California. Jessica Garcia serves as general manager. Lena Alvarez is associate producer. Elia Ramos is creative director. JC Polk is executive producer and founding partner. And Chad Peace is our president and founding partner. Thank you for listening. Olas Media. The Dear San Diego podcast is produced in collaboration with The Times of San Diego. Repeatedly recognized by the San Diego Press Club, The Times of San Diego delivers timely and transparent news to, for, and about America's finest city. To learn more on how you can support this trusted resource of information, visit timesofsandiego.com.